Inspections. We're talking mostly about inspections tonight, but we're open to questions about real estate of any kind. It's a real crazy market out there, extremely different than we've ever experienced. So there's lots of questions about what's going on, and, and we have answers, sort of. <laughs> Even this market is pretty crazy, so we're, some of the answers we're making up as we go, uh, because it's never happened before. But the inspection is what we're talking about tonight. And I've got a list here of different types of inspections you can do, and we're gonna go over a lot of that stuff, but we have a real inspector here tonight too, so we're gonna give him a chance. Um, and uh, Ben Crowley, I'm gonna let him come up and talk about inspections, and then we'll take over after that. Hey, I'm Ben, I am the owner of Bridgeline Inspections, and my wife, Inigo, and I operate here in, <coughs> operate here in the Valley. And so, my wife grew up here in Palmer, I grew up in Wasilla and Big Lake, so we've got a good just feel on how homes and stuff work here in the Valley. So, what I'm gonna talk about today mainly is what a home inspection is, what you can expect from it, and what you can expect from your inspector. So, by definition, most residential home inspections are classified as a visual only, non-invasive inspection, right? And what that means is that I'm not Superman, because they don't have X-ray vision, and I'm not punching holes in the wall. So, there may be things that you miss that are inside the wall. So, there are a lot of tools that we use, moisture meters, different types of probes, and things like that to see what's there. Some of the biggest concerns, moisture and structural stuff, they leave clues that they're there though. So, just because we can't see exactly what it is, there's a bump, there's a bubble, there's a water trail, there's something else to look at. So, <clears throat> something else about home inspections that I uh, picked up in some of my training the other day that I thought was absolutely hilarious is that the definition of a home inspection is a high liability, in-depth, multidiscipline, technical analysis of a home conducted under adverse conditions in front of a demanding audience requiring the generation of an incredibly detailed report prepared in an unrealistically short time frame. So, <laughs> I thought that was, I laughed too hard about that. But some of that is true. So, but we do do our best on that. So we have to be a generalist. We're not experts in everything. And a good home inspector is going to refer to the professional in that field when there is something that's above our training or our experience. So, like with your HVAC system, we're gonna look at it, we're gonna see what's there, and we're gonna say, hey, you should probably get the guy that spent his career working on this, to take a good look at it, see if you can do that. Same thing with structural stuff. If we see something that's an issue, that we're like, hey, this looks weird, we're gonna recommend that an engineer or a qualified contractor that looks at that. So, that's that. So, what do we look at in a home, right? So, what does a good home inspector look at in a home? So, a good home inspector is gonna look at everything that we possibly can without causing damage. So, that's attics, that's crawl spaces, that's basements, that's, you know, opening up heating systems, looking just, just the cover panels, not dismantling them or anything like that. We're looking for water, looking for stuff that just doesn't look right, or doesn't sound right. We're gonna make sure that our thermostats work, heat zones turn on, and look at that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> looking for electrical, we're gonna test outlets, different types of safety devices, make sure smoke alarms, CO detectors are there, look at water heaters, they're not hot water heaters, drives me nuts, it's a water heater. So, um, <laughs> side note there, so, um, look at that, and we'll build a report for you with that. So, um, yeah, got that. Got some notes here that we're taking a look at here. So, why do you want to get a home inspection? First and foremost important thing about getting a home inspection is you want a baseline on the home that you're buying, right? Because this is a big investment. If you take care of it right, it's gonna like take care of you also. So as you live in it, you take care of it, you want to know what's there. So <clears throat> you get the home inspection. Second reason for that is that there may be things that you want to negotiate. Right now in our crazy market, negotiation is not as good as if there was a buyer's market, right? And there's tons of houses and not many buyers. There's still a big deal though. You guys may want to talk about that. So, <clears throat> you also, you don't know what a seller is already planning on fixing or is prepared to fix once it gets talked about. You don't know what they're willing to fix. Also, you don't know if they even know about the issue. So, say you're in an attic, you're in a crawl space, nobody goes in those spaces, right? So, if there's something that's there, maybe nobody even knows about it, and most people aren't trying to be shady and hide stuff. So, 
talk with you about it and say, hey, this is some stuff that we'd like to get fixed on that. Your real estate agent will help you a ton with that also. Just knowing what's a realistic expectation and what is like probably not in our market right now. So, okay. Also, remember, everything is fixable. No matter what it is, there's a way to fix it. So that, you know, nothing is like the honor there. I've had seen homes lifted, putting your foundations under them. We're talking a large amount of money, a large amount of work. Stuff's gotta get fixed. It will mostly fix it. So, um, all right. Something else that's super important to remember is that the seller's not required to fix things on the home inspection, right? They usually do, but it's not something that they have to fix. So as you guys go into negotiations, make sure that you're talking with your real estate agent about that and what is a good expectation on what is actually gonna be fixed with that stuff. So the way that you find stuff that you wanna get fixed is sit down, look at the inspection report. Most home inspections are broken down into three categories. It's usually a health and safety concern, a primary concern, which would be structural issues, water leaks, a big thing, um, furnaces that are old or having issues, or maintenance concerns, which is gonna be pretty minor stuff usually, like silicone around tubs, paint that's apparently needs to get redone. Generally not cosmetic things though, so like little nail holes and stuff like that, that kind of stuff generally isn't in a home inspection. So you look at that list, you find the stuff that you would like to get fixed, and that's what you talk about, that's what you generally send you give to the sellers and you start the negotiation process on that. So, got that. Um, does anybody, take a pause here. Does anybody have any questions yet? My iPad's still not working. Do you guys see any questions? Mm -hmm. Not yet, but I do have one. Yes. How do one. You, especially in the winter time, how do you determine the age of the, of the roof, the compositions, sh shingles, whether they're Texture or comp, do you get up there and actually no. inspect that? That's what I was wondering. So it's pretty slick. Yeah, so there are some really cool ways to do that. Um, right now, I am just about done getting my drone certifications to be able to use drones commercially. And that is an amazing tool for doing that here in Alaska. Say so, so that again, what was it? The drone certification, the part 107, so you can use drones commercially to take photos, be good, look at roofs. There's a ton of value in that. And that actually helps a lot in the summertime because there's roofs that it's never really safe to walk on. Cedar shake roofs, we don't have a lot of terracotta up here, uh, and metal roofs, so super good thing. So there is limitations on that as far as being able to tell the state of the shingles in the winter time. You do determine a lot of the health of the roof from the attic. So if you have active water leak issues, and stuff that's been going on for a while, it's gonna have signs in there. You're gonna have sagging sheeting if your shingles are getting old and letting too much water come through. That can also indicate that there's heavy moss buildup on the north side of the roof that's holding a ton of moisture and you get your sag out of it. So, you can't see it 100%. There's still a lot of things and a lot of indicators that you can see from the inside that let you know that, hey, you know, maybe this roof's there. Also, knowing the age of the home and the lifespan of shingles helps with that. So, if your home's built like an 85, those are 20 year shingles, right? So usually there's at least somewhere on the house and you kind of see one or two shingles and you can tell if they've been replaced. And generally from the attic too, so you can kind of get a rough like 10 year ballpark on that. Mm. So that's that's about the best we can do with those right. in the winter time. So. Right, right. What are some of the things you look for, uh, like on a metal roof, what are some of the things you look for to see if, if there might be some issues? So. Number one thing that I look for is loose fasteners. Um, we tend to lose a lot of those in the winter time, especially on the bottom of the east as the ice builds up, your roof shuts, smacks those screws, and it starts to roll out. It's a super easy fix. You just get the next size up around, pull the bad one out on the good one in, yeah. and usually that fixes it. Um, we look for just build up older shingles that are, or older metal roofing that's sitting around, especially down around chimneys the corrosion from that creosote can start to like create rust spots. Just keeping it area on that kind of stuff. Looking at the boots where vent pipes and where um, like sewer gas vents come out, making sure that those look good. Uh, right now I use a small spotting scope and a, an adapter for my phone so we can zoom way in on that kind of stuff. 
and that works really good for like the summertime stuff for those. Um, but yeah, the fasteners is definitely the biggest thing we can use. My other question would be electrical. Yes. On the breaker bars. Yes. How detailed do you get? So I personally pull the panel cover off. I look at the inside of it. A lot of the standards of practice, I know for sure with InterNACHI, which is the International Association of Home Inspectors, I'm a part of that. They don't require you as part of their standards of practice to open the dead front cover. It's a proper name for a panel cover. Right. Um, I do open it because there's a lot of stuff, especially here in the valley where we have homeowners. <laughs> Loose building code, we'll call it. <laughs> and, and you know, you can tell a lot about the rest of the wiring in the home. If the panel's looking kind of goofy, it lets you know that hey, maybe there's some other spots we really need to take a look at and that kind of stuff to make sure we get good tests on all of our outlets and that kind of stuff. Or people added a welder outlet into the garage and didn't quite do it right. That happens too. Yeah. Um, something else that's important to remember about a residential home inspector, uh, <clears throat> which makes us different from new building code inspectors, is that we are not code inspectors. We are health and safety inspectors. Some of the stuff that we call out <clears throat> is code, uh, especially with like smoke alarms and spacing on balusters or stairs, but it doesn't mean that we are doing everything exactly out of the code book. And so we're not here to make sure that there's exactly 70 feet of wire inside a wall. Like we don't have any way to do that. We're here to make sure that the home is safe and livable and talk about things that the potential buyer may want to negotiate or even just know about on the home so that they can keep the value in their home with that kind of stuff. Now, I know a lot of guys, not a lot of guys, but I've seen it done where they'll run a 14-2 wire instead of a 12-2 through the whole house because, well, it's just going to the light switch. Do you see that much? Not a ton. You see uh, some of, not a ton. You do see it sometimes. Um, and is that still okay to use 14 2 wire for light switches? Because it's a it's a cheaper wire for the guys to buy. Yeah. And they really fudge. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I don't like it. Um, the chances of people pulling it and redoing it are super low on that. So if that's yeah. something that I catch where an undersized wire is used in the panel, we're going to talk about that because it could be overloaded. Okay. And that's an issue. Yeah. 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 So no, health and safety, that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. It does. Say. So I try to use common sense in my home inspections too because like use terminologies, use things that everybody can understand that way. And that's another sign of a good home inspector, somebody that can find whatever is there and bring it into a way that anybody can understand most stuff. Because like, if you don't understand your inspection report, which you just paid for to look at your house, it doesn't really do you a lot of good. So when you're looking at home inspectors, look at their sample reports online. They generally have them. If it's something you don't understand, look around for some other ones because there's somebody out there that has a report that you understand and usually they can relate better to also. Yeah, good. Cool. Um, I'm gonna talk about severities on things, right? So, health and safety concerns is something that usually comes up with, like, with that. Something that's important to remember about a health and safety concern is that it is not necessarily an expensive fix or a complicated fix. It just means that if it's not fixed, it could be a big deal. An excellent example of that is like an outlet cover. They're like, what, $1.10, $1.50, screws right on. But if it's not there, that's a big fix. So. Um, a lot of stuff with homes, even some of the primary concerns, it's fixing the P-trap, right? So definitely stuff to work with that. So um, that's kind of what I got right now. Do you guys? How about some examples of some really scary things that you've seen? If you could tell them without running <laughs> <laughs> um, So scary stuff. I opened up an electrical panel earlier this week that was wired completely backwards with no ground. So they had run all the neutrals to the ground wire, all the grounds to the neutral side, which means, so power comes in on the hot, goes out on the neutral. The ground's never supposed to have any electricity on it unless it get hit by lightning. So what they were doing is instead of running the, wire, the electricity the proper way, they were doing it backwards, which overloads the circuits and has the potential to actually light, light stuff on fire. So that was probably the sketchiest electrical thing I've seen in a while. Um, a 
looked at some of the uh, 50s homes in Anchorage, and those have always got interesting more on anyway. You know, um, on that note, older homes, there's generally a modern fix, especially for two-wire stuff, where there's no ground. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to pull all the water out of the house. They have modern fixes that a good electrician can do, like install a GFCI receptacle in that old two-prong outlet, and it gives you your ground protection. So having a quality contractor to talk with about repairs as you guys negotiate that can help a ton as far as your cost and just going through the negotiations with that. So make sure you have a good quality contractor to do the work for you. Um, structural stuff. I saw a brand new house that like had some big cracks in the foundation earlier. It was, well, let me say it It was built like in 2016, set for a while, and it was finished. And uh, it sat during the earthquake, and it had some, somebody had shoved two by fours under a footer to make sure that it didn't crumble anymore. It was pretty sketchy. Um, yeah. House looked great. Yeah. So you got the crawl space. Um, so what would be some tips that you could have for buyers right now looking at homes on just stuff that you typically see yeah. in, that you come up with in Alaska? So stick your head in your crawl space. Like look down there, see what it looks like, see if it smells goofy, see if it smells bad. That's a place that can cost a lot of money if there's microbials and stuff going on. So that does not mean back out of it. That just means that you know that there may be something down there that's more than a thousand bucks to fix. Mm -hmm. um, fire up the furnace while you're there. Turn up the thermostat a little bit, one or two degrees. Take a picture so you can turn it back down to the right temperature. Um, listen to the furnace. Make sure that it doesn't sound weird. Make sure it doesn't smell weird. Um, yeah, check, uh, you know, flip a couple light switches, that kind of stuff. I think the biggest one is like check crawl spaces. If you have the ability to look in the attic, usually you don't, but like look down there, see what's going on. Look for water. Have you ever found a dead cat or? Oh, I, I found cats, I found rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of dead mice, I found one today actually. Um, yeah. I found so, bats in attics too. I found a couple of bats. Is that all right? Wow. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, because you're going places that a lot of people never, never go look. Yeah, um, I actually did an inspection on the old post office that the uh, little blue one, it was like, I think it was 1933 it was built. And we were going through the attic and we found a bunch of old ice skates and toys and stuff in the insulation. It was super cool from like the 50s and stuff. Oh, that's cool. cool. That kind of stuff's super cool. Yeah. Um, we were, yeah, so that kind of stuff. I geek out about old houses a little bit because we don't get a lot of them. And I like right. visual. Um, so, other tips. Um, what about mold? Can you talk about mold a little bit? Yeah, so microbials is what we call them. Mold. Yeah. So, the only way you can determine what mold is is with a laboratory test. And that includes usually a swab and an air test to give you what is there. So, there are some home inspectors that do have the ability and the training to pull those samples on site. There's also some really good third party dice here in the valley. So anytime on a inspection report you hear microbial growth or organic growth, it's kind of a code word because we can't call it that. It's something you want to get more, you want to have it looked into more too. Um, as far as remediation work goes on that, I know there's a ton of different opinions on that kind of stuff. There is. Do your research, um, look at it, and just see what's out there to do it. It's not as cheap as it could be. Um, it's also very, very time intensive and labor intensive to do this. So there's a lot of time and labor that goes into it. So um, yeah, and also it's around us like everywhere. So as you do remediation, the goal is not zero inside the house. The goal is to match what's inside with what's outside, right? So, yep. And everybody reacts to it differently. So just because it didn't bother the sellers, it may bother you, right? Just because that's the way that it works. Like it all treats us all a little bit different, that kind of stuff. Some things that you should never do with it, don't just paint over it. It doesn't work, it comes right back through it. Mm -hmm. If you spray it with something, you can 
because that offhand shoots its missiles at you. That's the spores. So be very careful on how you deal with it. If you're gonna do it yourself, do your research, find out what's going on there. When you disturb it, it tends to get more volatile and cause more issues. So yeah. Yeah. All right. So well I have another question. Yes. So what can you recommend for sellers getting ready to sell their home? Like what kind of stuff do you see most commonly come up that would be easily avoidable? Yeah, so I got three things. First one, put your anti-tip device on your kitchen stove. <laughs> <laughs> They're universal ones that screw to the wall that are super easy. They're about 20 bucks. Um, that's one of them. That's probably the first health and safety thing we find. And it's super easy to do and it, it works out really well. Um, silicone around tubs, sinks, showers. Buy a couple of high quality tubes of it, scrape it out, make it look nice. Put the same color light bulbs in light fixtures. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a small thing, even if you have to move them around your house and you may not have to buy anymore, it makes it look like you take care of your home and you care about maintaining it properly and not just making whatever's around for it. It's a great thing with that. Um, if you have cool features about your home, leave a note about that so people know about it. Like we were looking, I did an inspection on a place out KGB that had these two-tone cam lights. You flip the light switch twice and it's like this incredible like LED hue light. It was like awesome. But if you didn't know about it, it's not there, right? Nobody will check that kind of stuff. So yeah, if you have cool features about your home, something like that, talk about it. It's a cool house. Like, mm -hmm. do it. Um, Make sure that like the dishwasher drain line between your anti-siphon valve, that little silver thing on your countertop and the drain is clean. A third of the dishwashers I test leak out of that, right? Like it's super easy to clean. The hose is a couple bucks and those if you don't want to clean it out. That's another awesome thing. Um, I have a question about that. Does it have to be above the counter? Can it be as long as it's above the flow of the dishwasher? What's the, so what's it needs, the rule? It needs to be an air gap. Okay. So it has to be able to have, so like the high loop can still siphon through. Like if it doesn't drain all the way and doesn't mm -hmm. pump all the way out, it's still full of liquid. So it has to have an air gap. So you can totally put an air gap under your sink. It's kind of sketchy because then you don't know if it backs up, then it goes under your sink. So the air gap is what needs to be there. So, um, yeah. Good. Yeah, good answer. Thank you. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, Make sure that like as you get ready for a home inspection too, that your attic and crawl space are available. Um, that way that you don't have to move your stuff because we don't want to break it. Not that it's a huge inconvenience, but like I don't want to break your stuff. So if it's out of the way, that kind of thing is super important to do. Um, other things, getting it ready. Yeah, if something's kind of squeaky, like move door hinges, make sure things latch, just kind of walk through the house and the stuff you use every day, make sure it still works good. Open your windows, close them, especially in the wintertime. Make sure that those windows slide easy so people can see it. Um, put your smoke alarms back up, like go buy new ones, like don't leave those down. <laughs> like, um, put them up there, smoke alarms, CO, de CO detectors, that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's kind of easy stuff. There's always more if you have you know, touch up paint, do that kind of stuff. Um, change the furnace filter. If you have a forced air furnace, put a new filter in it. Help the house smell a little bit better. Um, you should do those every 90 days, not once a year. <laughs> but it'll help your furnace last a lot better. I do have a question about the tipping, the anti-tipping for the stove. Mm -hmm. But we had an inspection here a while back where the inspector actually put anti-tip on the, uh, the with the armoire in the bedroom. They wanted tip protection on that, and they also wanted tip, or they wanted the, the strings to the blinds were too long. Mm -hmm. So are those things that are normal for an inspector, or was that just a, an extra picky person? I would say that that is a little bit over the top. For one thing, blinds and armoires are not part of a structure. They are a piece of furniture that's mm -hmm. there. So. Um, the home inspector should comment on things that are part of the home. So some of the things, like if it's something that's sparking, like a, a lamp, like you're going to talk about that. As far as the armoire though, the inspector doesn't know if it's staying or not, and that also
also the home inspector's recommendations. It's not code call out. That means that it is up to the buyers and the sellers to decide, to decide if that's something they're even gonna deal with. So, yeah, something super important to remember on that, so. Uh, do you do a lot of inspections for sellers before they list properties? And do you see a lot of benefit to that? Like, you, have you helped sellers probably save enough money to make that inspection cost worth it? Before 2020, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the last two years, a little bit. So the answer is yes. A pre-listing home inspection is a huge way to save money, especially if your house is 15 years or older. Yeah. Code cycles change about every six years or so. Stuff comes out. Not big stuff. And generally, not anything that's going to cost you a lot of money. But what that does, though, is that lets you, as the homeowner, if it's something you're capable of repairing, like that silicone around the bathtub or getting the light bulbs fixed, putting up the new smoke alarms, that's all stuff we can, most of us can handle. You don't have to pay a contractor. Right? Mm -hmm. And if it is something you need to hire a contractor for, you get to do it on your timeline, not in the you know, 45 days and you get whoever's available, right? And sometimes the guy that's available, you don't want to work on your house. <laughs> he's, he's not busy for a reason. Not always true, but that's something there. Um, you know, and also what it does is it shows you due diligence to the homeowner. So you have that home inspection, you said, hey, I hired somebody, he said this, we decided to fix these things. You don't necessarily need to fix all of it. There may be something on there and you're like, hey, we're not gonna deal with this. You just close it, cool. It's open negotiation, it's part of the table and people will get the whole picture of what's there too. So, then there's also the option to get the reinspection. Then you show that you, hey, you fixed all these things, it's done, and it adds a ton of value that way. So, generally, you can save so home inspection average between 400 or 450 and 500 bucks, depending on the size of the home and all that kind of stuff. Generally good handyman. If you get to pick the one you want and do that kind of stuff, it'll be about between like five and 700 bucks a day or so, right? If you have the chance to just take one day of work off of stuff that you can do for yourself, like that totally paid for it, right? That saves you that 500 bucks, the home inspection, and it adds just a way better front as you come into the market, so. Yeah, they're awesome. Uh, so before you get off, just because we can't read your logo on your shirt and your hat from here, is just state your name and your business again. <laughs> Definitely, so I am Ben Crowley and I am the owner of Ridgeline Inspections here in the Valley. So yeah, we'd love to answer any questions um, that you guys might have. Even if it's an undermined inspection we did, you know, about your home, any of that kind of stuff, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'll leave my contact information with Marty here. We can have it in the link so you guys can reach out to us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and all that stuff. So, you know, thanks for your time, guys. Thank you. Good.